This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad again. Again, we say this is the day the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship this Sunday of Pentecost. I'm Pastor Mark, and along with Pastor Wesley, we have the joy and privilege of serving this United Methodist Church of New Lenox. I welcome all of you here and all of you watching online or at home. This is truly an exciting opportunity for us. Not only did we just celebrate our outdoor worship this morning, but we are also celebrating uh, by intinction uh, communion. So uh, we will have an option to do that later, and we will tell you how to participate in that. As we gather together, let us welcome each other with the peace of Christ. If you are at home, check in, let us know that you're watching, and then send a message of peace to someone in your life. If you are here, let us stand if we're willing and able and pass the peace of Christ to one another. Would you join me in the opening prayer? O oh Lord our God, you are always more ready to provide your good gifts on us than we are to seek them and are willing to give more than we desire or deserve. Help us so to seek that we may truly find, so to ask that we may joyfully receive, so to knock that the door of your mercy may be opened to us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Our opening hymn today is Come Spirit, Holy Spirit, come confirm us number 331 in your hymnal or on the screen. I welcome all of our children uh, watching online and with us this week. Mostly school is done, but some still have a couple more days of school in our community. So I brought something special in this bag, and it is a, it's a Star Wars thing, in case any of you were wondering what it was. It's a Star Wars thing. It's a very special thing in the Star Wars universe called a holocron, just like church, Star Wars also has a lot of complicated words that don't necessarily mean anything. But in the Star Wars universe, the holocron is a very special tool. The Jedi use it to learn from various masters. It's kind of like a library. It teaches them, it guides them, it instructs them. I'll give you an example. You have to, you have to use the force here to unlock it. There we go starts, you can hear the, the sounds of the force. And then, if you want to get guidance from a Jedi Master, you just need to hold it a certain way and ask. A long time fought I did, consumed by fear that was. Though she I did not, a challenge lifelong it is not to bend fear into anger. It's very good advice, Master Yoda. 
That was from Master Yoda, reminding us not to be afraid, just like the Bible. But the Jedi Holocron also can be used to equip Jedi with special tools. So if you know kind of where to look in here, here we go. It's got a secret container. And inside is a crystal. And this is a kyber crystal. And that is the power of a lightsaber. You're familiar with lightsabers. And so often holocrons had these special little compartments that would have tools for Jedi. Now, why do I say all of that to teach you about Star Wars? No, I think it's a pretty good analogy for what Pastor Wesley's going to talk about today, which is the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we think the Holy Spirit's this weird, mysterious force, and it is in many ways. But the Holy Spirit's here to teach us, to guide us, to give us counsel, to connect us, and also to equip us for mission and ministry, to give us tools we need here at the table today. You will can receive tools, very special gifts for mission and ministry in the church. Would you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Let your Spirit guide us, teach us, and equip us for mission and ministry. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks, kids.
As we come to our time of prayer, I do remind you, if you have prayers and needs in your hearts, let us know. You can go to umcnl.com and fill out a prayer request so our prayer team can pray for you. If you'd like to be involved in that, just let us know and we'll add you to that. Always feel free to reach out to Pastor Wesley and I if there are things that you need help with in your life. As we come to our time of prayer, we will take a moment of silence. I will say a prayer and then we will ask that we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us adopt an attitude of prayer. Gracious God, as your Spirit hovered over the deep waters of the earth, you brought forth creation. Once again, cover the earth in your Holy Spirit, that your children may return from the depths as citizens of your kingdom. Heal our divisions by your word of love and righteousness. God, this Pentecost, infuse us with your Spirit. Urge us to vision and dream. May the gift of your presence find voice in our lives, that our babbling may be transformed into discernment and the flickering of many tongues light an unquenchable fire of compassion and justice. Holy Father, you who raised Jesus from the tomb, you who gave life to the valley of dry bones, make these dry, bleached bones of our lives live and breathe and grow again. Holy Spirit, blow through us. Turn the sin and sorrow within us into faith, power, and delight. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, as we continue praying the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard the sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native language. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't the people who are speaking Galileans, every one of them? How can then each one of us hear them speaking in our native language? Parthians, Medines, Elamites, as well as the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the regions of Libya bordering Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Rome, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own language. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them saying, they're full of new wine. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Friends, let us be in the spirit of prayer. Lord, we humbly ask that you would pour your Holy Spirit upon each and every one of us as we gather this day. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every one of our hearts truly be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen.
We're in the midst of a fun series simply called Speaking Theologically. And, and all we're doing is really talking about Christianity and really the God that we worship and the God that we serve. And so all theology means is it comes from the Greek word theos and logos, which is the word for God and the word for word. And so anything that we do theologically is how we speak of, how we think about, how we, how we wrestle with the very nature, being, and character of God. And everybody has theology. Everybody on earth does some form of God talk, even if atheism is a form of saying there is no God. It's very, very simple, but everyone has some form of theology. And so what we've been doing is we've been talking about how it is that we understand who God is. The God of the universe is where we started. How do we wrestle with that? How do we encounter? How do we begin to, to, uh, to explore who God really is? Last week we talked about how that God of the universe becomes incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, that everything we know about who God is is fully revealed to us in the fully human and the fully divine presence of Jesus the Christ. And then last week we finished up with this somewhat teaser, right? Why do I have faith in this Jesus Christ? What is it that calls me to have faith in this particular deity in this particular Jesus? And the answer is through the Holy Spirit. And so this morning is Pentecost. Wish to welcome you. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And so as is always, there are disclaimers. There's no way we can cover everything about the Holy Spirit. There's no way that we can cover everything that you may want to hear about. And so if there are lingering questions after this, feel free to reach out because it just might be able to be covered next week when we get into the Trinity. But as I say every single Sunday of this particular series, I invite you to sit up, strap on your seatbelts, put your tray tables in their full and upright position because there's a ton of content that will come at you very fast. As I said last week, so also I repeat, my wife constantly tells me, slow down, and I completely ignore her because I'm so stinking excited about this material. It is my personal theology. It's the, it's the, it's the way that I have come to faith. And a lot of this that I share with you is deeply personal. It's what I honestly believe. I'm not just sharing academics, but it is a part of where I've gotten my understanding from my academics, from my full devotion and adherence to the Scripture, and from the things that I've wrestled with late at night when you ask the deep questions of faith. That said, what I say is not necessarily without error. I have my heresy checker sitting behind the pulpit, and so I'm going to be held to account. But the idea is to think and explore theologically. Today is Pentecost. That's why we talk about the Holy Spirit. We are going to talk about the Spirit today, regardless of whether it was, regardless of where it fit in the series, because today is Pentecost. Pentecost is the celebration of the church. It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that gives birth to the church. So congratulations and happy birthday. You should go get cake today because it's the birthday of the church. You have the full permission of the pastor. And because it's a Sunday, all you have to do is break the cake in half, all the calories fall out, and you can eat to your heart's content. That's how it works. Ask any food scientist, right? So, you should eat cake. Today is the birthday of the church. Pentecost is established back in Leviticus. It's in the 23rd chapter. The 23rd chapter of Leviticus goes through the major festivals or the feast days of Judaism. After the feast of Pentecost, uh, I'm sorry, after the feast of Passover, Passover is the festival that's very, very closely situated and corresponds to our celebration of Easter. Happens right around Good Friday, which is why we celebrate Good Friday when we do and why we celebrate Easter when we do. It usually falls very close to Pentecost. But at, I'm sorry, Passover. But after the Passover, Leviticus 23 is very clear. You shall count off seven weeks, seven Sabbaths, 50 days. 50 is where we get the word for Pentecost. 50 days after the Passover is when you celebrate this amazing feast, which is why it was one of the two major festivals of the early church. Not to break or burst anybody's bubble, but Christmas comes much later. It's a later addition to the liturgical calendar. But Easter and Pentecost were the two earliest celebrations in the major church, uh, in the earliest church. It was the time when pilgrims from every country and every nation of the then known world would swoop into Jerusalem to celebrate this amazing feast. It was one of the three required pilgrimages, and so that's why everybody was there. Now, Pastor Mark was very deliberate about the reading of these, for which I am so deeply grateful. Truth is, I made fun of him because what, a lot of, what, what happens a lot of times is we arrive at this laundry list of names and we go really fast, right? 
Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, Judah, you know, right? And, and the whole thing is, whether he pronounces them right or wrong, he says them with authority, and we all kind of nod in agreement, and then we're all really happy we weren't the ones at the lectern reading it. But the point of that is, every nation of the then known world was gathering in Jerusalem, and they all begin to hear in their own language the incredible witness of who Jesus Christ is. That's what they're doing. It's not some random language. It's not gibberish. These are all Galileans, people who were not very wise or very well trained. They hadn't studied foreign languages. They didn't know how to converse in all of the languages of the empire, which is why at the very tail end of the reading today, aren't all of these speaking Galileans? And how is it that each of us are able to hear each in our native language? And some make fun of them and say, they're drunk. Which isn't true, says Peter, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. But the point of that is that everybody hears the language of others. And the New Testament is clear that the Holy Spirit gives this gift of speaking in other languages. It's not gibberish, it's not garbage, it's language that can be interpreted by others. And so the Apostle Paul becomes very clear in 1 Corinthians that if the languages are spoken in a worship service, they should be in a tongue that other people can understand for the edification or for the building up of the church. With me? All right, here we go. So, who is the Holy Spirit? Why do I have faith in Jesus? It's because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, very simply defined, is the very Spirit of Jesus Christ. That's it. The Spirit is the very Spirit of Jesus Christ. So the Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That's it. If that's all you take from this, then you will have perfected the art of what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the incarnate Christ that's poured out on the church at Pentecost, gives birth to the church. It is revealed to us that Jesus Christ is is the incarnation of the God of the universe. And therefore, God visits us in the person of Jesus Christ, and because of the Holy Spirit, we have faith in Jesus Christ, who is God the Father, the maker of heaven and earth. With me? The thing of it is, the Holy Spirit is completely unknowable in and of itself. The Holy Spirit is not known in and of itself. It's only as we come to faith in Christ that we begin to recognize that the reason why we have faith in Christ is because of the Holy Spirit. With me? As we come to faith in Christ, that's how we notice that the Holy Spirit is what links us to the person of Jesus Christ who is God the Father, which means we don't have faith in anybody else. How many of you believe that Abraham Lincoln existed? Even if you're watching at home, you raise your hand. You may feel really weird in your living room, but just raise your hand. How many of you believe Abraham Lincoln existed? All right, most of you. There's a few of you who are still on the fence that's kind of in doubt, right? Most of you believe Abraham Lincoln exists, but we don't have faith in Abraham Lincoln. We don't trust Abraham Lincoln with our lives. So why is it we would trust our lives with? Why is it we have faith in the person of Jesus? It's because that's the role of the Holy Spirit, to link us in faith, to give us the trust and the confidence and the hope in who Jesus Christ is and not in anybody else. It's why in the New Testament Jesus teaches that the only unpardonable or the only unforgivable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Because blasphemy against the Holy Spirit or the severing of our relationship to the Holy Spirit is what severs us from the very Spirit of Jesus Christ who is the maker of it all. With me? In other words, faith in Christ, because we have faith in Christ, it is the faith of the Holy Spirit that is available to us. And we cannot sever that relationship, or essentially that would be the unpardonable sin. Make sense? So where is the Holy Spirit? Where? Where would you find the Holy Spirit? Everywhere. We believe that the Spirit of God is available to anyone, everywhere, at all times. It's the Holy Spirit that is present from the very beginning of creation. Well, the Holy Spirit is always co-eternal with God. In the very beginning of the scripture, from the very first verse, in the, beginning was, uh, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. It's present right there in the first verse of the Bible. The Spirit is present throughout the Hebrew scriptures, through what we would call the Old Testament. The Spirit is poured out on the church at Pentecost, gives us wisdom and grace, gifts, and, and ultimately the fruits of the Spirit. It's known like ruach is the word in Hebrew. It's that wind or that breath or that, that's what the spirit is. In the New Testament, the word is pneuma. 
And that's the wind of God, the spirit of God that comes to breathe into us. That God breathes into us the breath of life and calls us very good. In fact, every time you breathe, that's the sense of how close the Holy Spirit is. If the Holy Spirit is everywhere, then every time you breathe, which is why breathing is so important, which is why Karen tells me to slow down. (gasps) It gives us a chance to inspire, to be inspired. To receive the respiration that is the very presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay? With me? And again, we said, to whom is the Holy Spirit available? Everybody. In Methodism, John Wesley believed that everywhere you went, you'd be able to encounter somebody who has access to or has the ability to, to, to be present in and with the Holy Spirit. That God would be accessible to anyone you meet. And so the objective when you meet other people is to look for the ways that the Spirit is active in them that you may find common ground. Wesley would call that provenient grace. God is proveniently available long before they're aware of it, long before you're aware of it. There is, God is able to be at work in every single person that you encounter. The Wesley brothers were very clear on that. Even in the writing of their hymns, what they would do with many of their hymns is set them to bar tunes so that you could get theology into them. And so they would sing the songs of the taverns. And I want to be very clear so there's no misunderstandings at this service. It's not that they would always say to go to the taverns. It's that they use the music of the taverns to pull people into a deeper theology. Just want to make that clear given the feedback I received earlier. Got that? So Wesley's... The Wesley brothers would write hymns that were very well inspired by tunes that would not be easily singable. We try to pick hymns that are somewhat singable, but occasionally we throw one at you where many of you look at us like we're awfully strange. Like 363 is one of my favorite hymns. It's a very, very peculiar hymn to sing, but the theology in it is very deep. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood. It's a beautiful, beautiful hymn. In fact, the Weirmans are going to play it for you sometime. It's going to be magnificent. They're going to do a duet. It's recorded so we can all hold them accountable. I can't wait to hear it. I will be here a long time. Thank you. I love you. The question that my professors would always ask is, so what? Who cares? Why does this matter? I'll tell you why it matters, because I ultimately, I ultimately believe that every single one of us need access to the Holy Spirit. We, definitely, we distinctly need to be called back to a depth of the fruit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. At its core, the Holy Spirit is what gives us a relationship with God, and it's because of the Holy Spirit that we have this fruit of the Holy Spirit. So the fruit of the Spirit, if you've ever learned that VBS song, the fruit of the Spirit is not a pineapple Fruit of the Spirit is not a pineapple. If you want to know the Spirit, you might as well hear it. It can't be a fruit of the Spirit because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you know this one? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So let's go through those really, really quickly. And again, I can't cover everything because there's always more content. But love. Love is agape. It's that self-sacrificial, that other-focused love. It's that focus. It's that love that's not about emotions. It's about a covenant. It's not about a contract. It's not about a relationship that's built on a contract. It's a covenant that we desire to act lovingly even when we don't feel it. And there are times we don't feel love for one another, don't we? If you've ever had a friendship, there are times in every friendship where you don't necessarily feel like loving your friend, Right? The only way to to maintain friendships is by exercising forgiveness and grace. It's the way that any marriage is maintained, forgiveness and grace, because there are times we don't always feel love. It's not a pitter-patter of the heart. It's not, oh, that's not not the concept of the New Testament form of love and agape. Love is self-sacrificial. It's that benevolent form of love. It's people like my Sunday school teachers, and and I want to remind everybody that I was the exemplar par excellence of what it is to be a Sunday school teacher, a student. When I was in Sunday school, I would always fold my hands. I was pious. It was as if I had an angelic uh, halo over me the entire time. Don't argue with me. Right, I, I, that's not exactly right. I was kind of a terror. 
And so when I think of agape love, I think of my, I think of my Sunday school teachers who would pour out love even if they didn't necessarily feel it for me. They wanted to demonstrate what, what genuine love is. And so the question is, do we actually have this kind of love or do we exercise it even with people who are disagreeable or unlovable? It's a fruit of the Spirit. The other is joy. The next one is joy. There's love, joy. Joy is seeing the world with a sense of hope no matter what the circumstances are. It's finding gratitude in every situation. So there's a journal that I have at home. I actually got it from somebody who is a friend of mine who, who always said, you know, okay, fine, I'm grateful. That's the title of the journal. And then it goes on and on and on. But the, the idea of, be, of finding joy comes out of our gratitude. I think of Paul in prison who experiences joy. Even in the midst of the dungeon, he writes Philippians, which is one of the most joy-filled books of the New Testament. In four short chapters, he refers to joy or rejoicing 16 times because it's not something that's based on circumstances. It's based on a deeply held understanding of how much God truly loves and cares for us regardless of our circumstances. After all, it's one of the things that we say in this church frequently, that God loves you and there's Nothing you can do about that. That's where we find joy. The other example, I talk about homecoming, where we got trounced. Uh, it was, it was um, <clears throat> Caneland. 45 nothing. my senior year homecoming game. And I think of the cheerleaders who are like, defense! And like, there's, well, there's no point in walking out of the field. It's just not worth it, right? What's it like to be a, a cheerleader when circumstances aren't going your way? Do you have joy? Peace. Peace is not the absence of conflict. The word for peace, especially in the Hebrew scripture, is shalom. Shalom is the ability to see anything, regardless of circumstances, and to rely on faith and to know that our soul is secure with one who loves us more than we could ever ask or imagine. In the Old Testament, especially in Isaiah, he looked forward to the day when we would beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks, that any weapon of war would always be used as an instrument for farming. That we were not to lift up sword against anyone else or learn war anymore. The vision of the prophets is always that a peace. A peace is always that sense of an internal joy that can come to us or give us a sense of calm even when everything else seems to be swirling about us. It's that kind of peace that no matter what happens, we could still sing that hymn, It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Do you have peace? Patience. Patience is being long-tempered or long-fused. And the true test of patience is to ask somebody near you, um, do I have patience? Um, if I were to ask my wife that, the answer would clearly be no. Um, another way to think about patience, or the way that I constantly wrestle with it, is that it's intentionally deciding to move the speed of another person. And so one of the places that I always think about patience is intentionally moving at the speed of another person when you have to move at the speed of another person because they're driving in front of you. Do you have patience? Love, joy, peace, patience. What's next? Kindness. Long say it's coming. Kindness. Kindness is really a genuine concern for others, how they feel. It's treating every encounter or every person as if you are the student. It'd be acting curious instead of lashing out with disagreements. Philippians 2, verse 3, oh, it says that with humility, we think of others as better than ourselves. Kindness is giving somebody else the opportunity to be the teacher while we become the student. Random acts of kindness, or racks, is what we teach at Joy Camp all the time. And instead of tearing one another down, we use balcony language. We use random acts of kindness to build people up. You know where you can use random acts of kindness and it makes one of the, mo one of the biggest differences? Go to a restaurant and act kind to the people who are serving you. When most tables are always putting them down and demanding everything, I dare you, just act kindly towards somebody. It will change everything. The way that you treat a mechanic, the way that you treat somebody in the grocery store when they're checking you out, act kind to those who are nearest you because there is every opportunity for everyone else to beat them down. I believe that kindness is what radically transforms the situation, to treat people like you are the one who wants to encourage and support one another. Do you exhibit kindness? Goodness is the next one. It's all about generosity. It's giving the self for others. Really, it's being generous with our time, our talent, and our treasures. That's what it is. It's the opposite of being Scrooge. It's the, it's the idea of being a cheerful giver. One of the things I love about being a cheerful giver in 1 Corinthians is the word for cheerful from, from the Greek is really helios, so 
or, or another way to translate it isn't just cheerful, it'd be to be a hilarious giver. Imagine if we were to put offerings in the basket in the back or go online and donate, and what we do is we, we offer a gift to God's purposes, and we laugh. <laughs> isn't it wonderful to be generous? Try it. No, I'm serious. Try it. We'll give you a chance and worship in a little bit. Go ahead and uh, be generous and laugh. <laughs> you demonstrate goodness. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Faithfulness is, is, is basically meaning are you worthy of trust? This isn't just something that we do. It's who you are. You can't act faithful. You are faithful. You are worthy of trust. Are you trustworthy? Can God count on you? Can others count on you? Are you faithful? Gentle, gentleness is not meekness. Uh, I'm sorry, it's meekness, not weakness. It's like velvet-covered steel. It's like the ability to pick up a contact lens or a butterfly. It's not about exercising brute strength, but it's about how we use our words because, it's, again, super easy to tear people down. Gentleness is the ability to lift people up. It's the opposite of being harsh, right? Now, I know that you're brilliant, you're brilliant because you're here, but, but do you exhibit gentleness? Self-control is the last one. Self-control is that internal, that inner ability to regulate your outward actions. The way I always think about that is the 1972 Stanford study, you know, where they put marshmallows in front of kids. You may have seen this, right? If you can, stare, if, if you can sit with a marshmallow for long enough, they'll give you another marshmallow, but if you eat it, that's it. And the kids that could stare at the, the kids that ended up staring at the marshmallow for long periods of time couldn't control themselves. They eventually gave in and ate it. Kids that could distract themselves were the ones that ended up being able to get a second marshmallow. <laughs> Self-control is the ability not to just simply dive in or participate in everything. Okay. Self-control only appears four times in the Bible. It's not the highest of virtues, but it's about self-surrender. It's not what I desire, it's what God would desire for us. Do you have self-control? And here's, here's the thing. I honestly think all of us need the Holy Spirit. All of these, the fruit of the Spirit, these are things we desperately need. But the only way that we receive them is by actively attending to our faith, by abiding in the faith. The Holy Spirit is, just to kind of recap real quick, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, who is God the Father, is the very Spirit of Jesus that comes to dwell in us. As we come to faith in Christ, the more that we abide in Christ, the more that we begin to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. How do we do this? By devotions, by our disciplines, to be careful what we pray for, because we'll have every opportunity to practice any of these. If you pray for more kindness, God will give you the, ex the ability to exercise kindness. If you pray for more patience, God will give you every opportunity to practice patience. My pastor growing up always said, be careful what you pray for. God will give you every opportunity to practice it, and it's true. But the Holy Spirit doesn't yell at us. The Holy Spirit is not necessarily a voice in your head. Some people experience that. I, I haven't. But the way that I always experience the Holy Spirit is through those gentle nudges, that little <clears throat> that check in the soul that nudges, encourages us, and, and guides us toward the right decisions. And here's the thing. It's always easy to ignore the Holy Spirit. But my recommendation is, don't. But I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit that mediates Jesus Christ, who is God the Father Almighty. I believe in the Holy Spirit who is nearer than anything else that we breathe. I believe in the one who is available to literally everyone. I believe in the one who brings about new life and the fruit of the Spirit. You know, there's a reason why Pentecost was one of the two major holidays in the church. It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's what changes countless lives. It still does so today. And if you're, and if you're willing, it will change our lives as well. So the question I leave you with this week is, how does all this hold together? How does this whole thing about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how does this stuff hold together? Well, that's next Sunday when we talk about the Trinity. But in the meantime, let's be in the spirit of prayer, shall we? Lord, we humbly ask that you would pour your spirit upon us and give us a beautiful sense of the gift of life that you and you alone provide. Help us to hear what it is that you say so that we may be attentive to the ways that you nudge our hearts, nudge our souls, and speak to our minds. 
Would you remind us of the gifts that you constantly pour upon us, especially on this day of Pentecost? And help us always to give you our thanks and praise as we joyfully turn to you in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. Friends, as we prepare for the sacrament of Holy Communion, I invite you to hear the invitation to the table. That Christ our Lord invites all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live at peace with one another. Friends, I invite you to join me as we confess our sins to God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not heard, we have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. But forgive us, we pray, and free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that's what proves God's love toward us. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. At this time, we have an opportunity to reflect on the ways in which God is calling us to experience the exercise of our generosity as we provide of our gifts, our tithes, our treasures, our talents at this time. We invite you always to go online. There's a basket in the back, in, in the back of the church, or you can always give through our app. Spend a moment and hear the Word of God. Friends, let us join together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you formed us in your image and you breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, for your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. In the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke the bread, 
gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, and after giving thanks to you, he gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this. Take and drink. For as often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so it is in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, that we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on each of us gathered here out of love for you and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we could be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit unite us so that we would be one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All of this we humbly pray through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, where all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, the bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ, and the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. This morning, you have the opportunity to participate in the United Methodist Church, we believe that the table is open for anybody and everybody who desires to participate in this feast. We'll have a couple of stations that are here in the front. Well, maybe one station here in the front and the center. We'll also have a station for gluten-free that will be off to the side. And if you don't feel comfortable receiving of the elements, we will also be able to have the little, uh, the little cups. And so we invite you to participate in any way that you are most comfortable participating. But as you come forward, you'll receive a significant piece of bread. We invite you to take it, to dip it into the cup, keep your fingers out of the chalice, but allow yourself to participate in the fullness, to receive both kinds as we join together in the participation of this incredible and beautiful sacrament. Again, in the United Methodist tradition, there is nobody who is excluded from this table. It is a genuinely open table. And so those of you, if anyone is serving with us, you may also please come forward at this time as we participate in this feast.
Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you give yourself so fully to us. Would you grant to us your grace that as we prepare to depart from this place, you may empower us now to give of ourselves for others. And for all that you give to us, we offer you our thanks and our praise in the matchless, precious, and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, as you're able, let us stand together and join in our closing hymn, number 420, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. as you depart this place, know always that the living Lord will be with you, above you to watch over you, beneath you to lift you from grief and from sorrow, beside you to befriend you, behind you to encourage you, before you to show you the way, and always within you through the presence of the Holy Spirit to give you the gifts of faith, hope, and love. And so go forth always in grace and in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.